fan there for the families with videos and, and working with our video here at the church. And today I talked to him and I asked him if he would do something special for me, a little different. And uh, today we're going to be dealing with the book of Judges, Judges, the sixth chapter. And uh, I'll be calling out various scriptures and he will be putting those scriptures on the board. So uh, I thank him for that. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you today seeking your presence and the power of your Holy Spirit in opening our mind to the scripture so that we can not only just hear it, but we can incorporate it in our lives and make it a part of our behavior and our conduct so that it might be pleasing to you. So as we go into the study of this word on this day, I pray that someone will receive something that they need, that will shed light on something that is dark in their thinking, that open up a path that has been hindered to them. So God, we pray that not only this message, but the message as it is being preached in churches all across the nation and the world, will serve its purpose will not return void, but that people might receive it and adopt it to their lives and become better, making our whole world better in the process. So we thank you for this moment and we seek the presence of your Holy Spirit in Christ's name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm not going to be reading as you see in your bulletin, I have a large, long scripture there. And uh, I'm putting it there because I want you to uh, take it home after the message, look it over, think about it, and study it. But we will be going through it as we go forward today. My beloved brothers and sisters, there is something that is common to all of us. All of us. I know it's common to me, I've experienced. And that is, sometimes we experience doubt. Amen. We doubt that certain things can happen. We doubt some things even that we've heard in the scripture. How can that be possible? Because it doesn't fit the logic of our reasoning. And so sometimes things that we don't quite understand, we doubt it. We doubt it. Now, the word doubt, it refers to your mind being in a state of uncertainty. You're not sure. And when you are uncertain, you lack strong conviction about certain things, especially about religious things, about spiritual things, about doctrine, Christian doctrine. You don't have real conviction in your heart and in your mind regarding this thing. Now, listen, it involves questioning what is before you. I want to question this. I, I doubt it. And you are, you are hesitate to fully accept it. Yeah. Even uh, revelations from God, you don't quite accept it because they don't fit within the realm of your logical thinking. So you doubt it. Now, doubts can sometimes uh, come about as a result of intellectual. Some people think they're too smart to believe the Bible. So they endow it. We send our children off, we grow them up in church and they go to college and come back and all of a sudden they got, they're too smart now. They don't believe all of that stuff anymore. Intellectual 
of God. And then personal experiences. You had some things happen to you in your life. And you wonder why. And you doubt if you experience it again that it's going to come out different because of the dilemma and the emotional struggle that you were dealing with as you were going through it. But I want to tell you something. One of the things, my beloved Christian, that you're going to discover, that doubt is a natural part of the Christian journey. All right. And Satan is always there trying to increase your doubt about what God can do and who God is. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he showed up. If you are the Son of God, do this. He's putting doubt in your mind. Because he knows that doubt, it will hinder you from doing what you are supposed to do. Some of you, you've been called to do certain things right now, but you doubt it. And you do not think you are going to be able to do. And when you have excessive doubt, it can lead to religious instability. It can lead to a lack of religious commitment because you are not sure. Listen, we're going to be dealing with the doubt today. We're going to be examining a young man by the name of Gideon as he faces that particular challenge that we all deal with. However, before we get to Gideon, there are many Bible characters. Moses. Moses, when he was called to go and lead the people out of bondage in Egypt, the first thing that he did was express doubt about his ability to do it. When God told him to go, he began to, I, I, I can't, can't, can't speak right. And he looked for a reason to support his doubt. And because of that, God said, I'll give you somebody else to speak. I'll let Aaron do it for you. And when you doubt what God would do, he will not push you to do something, but he will use somebody else and you will miss out on the blessing. Listen, Peter, we know of Peter, he, he's one of the strongest characters in the gospel, the apostles. But yet still, when he was out on the water with Jesus and the storm was coming up, and Jesus told him to, by faith, get out of the boat and walk on water. And he was doing it until he started doubting him that he could do it. And when he started doubting, he started sinking. And we're like that. Anytime God tells us to do something and doubt come in, we start sinking. And find ourselves not able to do what God wants us to do. And then remember old Thomas. Praise God for Thomas. Thomas just made it clear. Lord, I believe. But help my my unbelief. I, I doubt that the resurrection has actually taken place. Help me believe, Lord. I doubt. Down in Thomas highlighted a missed opportunity, listen, to learn how to believe without sin. <laughs> Praise God. Let me say that again. To be a real strong Christian, you're going to have to believe certain things that you cannot see with your physical eye. So brothers and sisters, as I go through this lesson today, I'm going to invite you to share in this experience that God was trying to pull Gideon out of a state of doubt in order for him to do what God wanted him to do. And God would send us in different directions to get us to the place where he wants us to be. In the book of Judges, let's look at Judges, verse one. I know the scripture.
scripture starts at 11 in your bulletin. But I want you to just follow me and thank you, Deacon Smith. He's going to be putting it on the board. And listen to this. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Now this is going to lead into the subject of the house. Stay with me. But first of all, the people of God, Israel, they had been living a very good life. They had leaders like Barak and Deborah. They had great leaders and they had been leading a very good life under the power of God. And here in the book of Judges, now Judges is about the leadership of the people of God coming into the promised land and he put judges over them. One with Deborah, one with Barak. We want to look at Gideon moving into that position. However, here's a transition from the leadership of Deborah and Barak when we get to verse 1. It says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. And let me tell you something. You can be a good Christian, but when you do evil in the sight of the Lord, the Lord will do something to you in order to put you back on track. I wish I had a praying prayer. These people were God's people, and it was not anybody else but God who caused them to fall into the hands of a more powerful nation, the Midianites. God caused them. They had been in slavery in Egypt, and then they went through a period of developing their nation, and now all of a sudden, they are evil cause them to go back into bondage. And I want to tell you something. We got to be careful. Praise God. Listen to what happened. Verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves dens and caves and strongholds which are in the mountains. Verse 3, so it was whenever Israel had sown, many nights would come up, and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their hand, coming in as numerous as the locals. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And, at the end of verse 6, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now let's look at this content from 2 to 6 and see what is going on. God had allowed Midian to capture the people of Israel. Why? Because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And what happened to them is that they were no longer living in luxurious homes and all of that. They were now in caves. And they were now in dens because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's what it was. These people that God had released on them because of their evil, listen, they would watch them grow their crops, feed their livestock, and as soon as harvest time would come, they would swarm, they would swoop down on them and take all of their products, and therefore they worked for nothing. All of their hard work was for nothing. And when I read that, I remember a Tulsa, Oklahoma. Amen. Well, 
where that Wall Street was one of the most prosperous industries in the United States. And all of a sudden, a group of midnight showed up. And they swooped down on them, and they took everything that they had earned and killed many of people in the process. And now, when we look at the scripture, we wonder why. Yes, evil prevailed, but what did we do in the sight of God that caused evil to come upon us? That's a good question. That is a good question. The God said, um, these Midianites, they didn't just show up out of nowhere. They showed up because God had sent them. And I ask sometimes the question, how much evil has we endured as a result of our own evil? What have we caused that has caused so much to be tragically striking to us, our children? incarcerated all across this nation in numbers that you cannot imagine. Killing each other along the streets. Drug addiction everywhere. What evil? Are we doing something evil in the sight of God that is producing evil upon ourselves? This is what was going on. And this is what the scripture said had taken place to the Israelites, the people of God as a result of that. Verse 7 through 10. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt, and I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered out of the land of the Egyptians and out of the land of all who oppress you and drove them out before you and gave you this land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. You know, brothers and sisters, we have to put this in perspective. God says he sent a messenger to them. And what did that message? They were wondering why is all of this stuff happening to us? Why are we living in cages? Why are we in den? Why are our children smoking more drugs than anything? Why is all this stuff happening to us? And then the Lord reminded them of something. And the God says, listen, I want you, 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 you cry to me, cause you're in a cave. I finally got your attention. <laughs> Amen. When you were living good and riding high, you had forgotten about me. You started living and forgetting all about me. You disobeyed me. You did evil. But now you're in a cave. Praise God. Now you're living in death. And now you're crying out to me. I'm going to send you a prophet. I'm going to send you a preacher. And here's what this preacher is going to tell you. You were slaves in Egypt. And I brought you out. I took care of you while you were wandering in the desert for 40 years. I sent rain in Mama. I took care of you. And I gave you this land, and you're doing very well. But you are crying out to me, and you should be crying out to yourself because you have disobeyed my voice. You disobeyed my voice. And listen, I have to tell you, because I'm standing before people who have experienced the same thing as Israel. We were in bondage in America. Amen. 1619 to 1865, you just now celebrated Juneteenth. And that was the end of that bondage. But what happened, God said, I brought you out. Not the Civil War, not the Emancipation Proclamation. I am the one that brought you out. And when I brought you out, you have done great. You, many of you, like Oprah, have become millionaire. You have Barack Obama, who have become president. You have all of these great scholars, lawyers, doctors among you. But you're still suffering as a people because you are 
to the Lord. But you should be crying out to yourself. You are the source of your own suffering. Yes, yes. Obey the voice of God. Listen to his voice. Do what he wants you to do. And stop doubting that you have the ability to do it. Are you with me? All right, let's move on. Let's now go to verse 11, all the way up to verse 13. Now God sent a prophet to tell them that. And then after the prophet, guess what? Look at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebin tree, which was in Oprah, not Oprah Winfrey, which belonged to Joash the Abednite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with me, and then why?
You're mighty. You have that. And I guess, I guess old Gideon would look back and say, who was he talking to? Me? Mighty? And he began to question what did he say. He said, Lord, if the Lord is with us, and then why has all this happened to us? Sometimes stuff can happen to you and you think that God has forsaken of all of my trouble. Why are we in cave? Why are we going through this? Why is all our children in prison? Why? So many kids killing each other on the streets, homelessness. Why is all this so? Why? If you are with us, God. And then he says, yes, I heard what the preacher said. The preacher just came and he pointed out to us that you brought us up out of Egypt, but Lord, You left us stranded out here in it. That's a mind of doubt. Your situation in life can come upon you in such a way that it causes you to doubt whether God is with you or not. Where is God in the midst of all of this? I've been there. I've been in a situation I've been asking, where is God? Lord, I, I, I preach your word. I teach your people. I've been doing this all these years, and here I am. Laying on an operating table with heart condition. Where is God? Where is God? Have you been there? Sometimes we wonder. Verse 14. Notice this. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Verse 15. So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. When God comes to you, tell you to do things. You're like Moses. I can't talk. Amen. You start figuring out all that stuff about yourself. I don't have the level of education. I have no PhD, no math. You start talking about all that. God says, I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm not worried about your ability. I'm concerned about your availability. He said, now, Gideon, don't start telling me that your family is weak. And don't start telling me you are the weakest one in the family. Why you pick me, the Lord? Why, why me? I'm the weakest one. I'm from Manasseh, the weakest tribe. Why me? The Lord says, listen, I know that before I ask you to do it. But didn't I tell you that you are a man of valor? So I want you to go in the might, the strength that I see in you and not in your weakness. That's what I want you to do. Don't, don't show up trembling at the knee because I am a weak person in my family.
excuses. I can't do this. My skin is not light enough. I can't do this. I'm not tall enough. I can't do this. I'm female and this is only for males. I can't do this. You do what God has called you to do and God will stand with you. And you will defeat everything out there that is against you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. All right, let's go to a conclusion almost here. I want to read some long sections of this scripture. Starting with verse 17 to 21. Then he said to him, If you have found favor, if I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign. Show me a sign that it is you who talk to me. Show me God that you are God. Amen. He said, do not depart from me, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you, he said, and I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in, he prepared a young goat and an unleaded bread and brought the ethic of the flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and he brought them out to him under the Caribbean tree and presented him. Then the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pull out the broth, he said. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and the fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared from sight. You want a sign? You want a sign? You want to see that? What, what do you want me to do? Gideon says, when I'm going to go, I'm going to get him to go. Amen. Then I'm going to get some bread. I'm going to bring it out. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. Bring it out and put it on the rock. He says, now, watch this. Have you ever seen a rock turn into a fire? I wish I had a crazy crowd. Amen. Listen, God says, if you don't believe, I'm going to do something that your logical mind cannot understand. I'm going to turn a rock into fire and burn up the meat and burn up the bread right in front of your eyes. Have God ever worked a miracle in your eyes? Have God ever done something before you that surprised you? But when he did it, you knew that it was only God and God himself because nobody else was able to do it. And he called it the Lord 
is peace. And to that day, it is still there. Let me tell you something in conclusion. All of us need to start giving altars. <laughs> Whenever God has done something to and for you, you should feel something to remember how God has removed out from your mind, strengthened you. Get on your knees and pray. And when you go out and you see the result of that prayer coming through, you need to ask God. Ask God, what can I do? So that every time I look at this, I remember what you have done for me. Please stand.